it looks like we have reached kind of a steady area. Folks are still joining in. Um, just a reminder, there will be a recording of this webinar available on our website in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on that. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Maura Bonini. I'm a member of the admissions team here at Columbia Business School. Uh, we are so excited for you all to join us at our um, Chazen Institute for Global Business a segment of our webinar series. Um, the CBS Experience webinar series is something we are just kicking off for prospective students, admitted students, um, anyone to really learn more about the different centers, programs, initiatives, institutes um, on Columbia Business School's campus. So we're really excited for you to be joining us um, to learn today more about the Chazen Institute for Global Business. Um, just to give an overview of how the webinar is going to work, um, we're going to start off with some welcome and introductions. I'm going to turn it over to the Chazen team, um, a current student and an alum, to talk a little bit about their experiences in just a moment. Um, then we're going to give an overview of the Institute, dive into the student experience, and then we will have time at the end for question and answer. Um, so please feel free throughout the webinar to utilize the Q&A box um, and ask any questions you may have about um, any of the um, study tours, immersions, exchange program questions that you may have, um, any questions about Josephine and Elisa's experiences, please feel free to throw those in there. And I, at the end, will take some time to turn it over to our fabulous panelists to answer those questions. Um, but to start, I'd love to turn it over um, to Jennifer and Melissa from the Chazen Institute, um, just to give a little bit of background on um, who they are, what they do at the Chazen Institute, and then we'll we'll move on to the students. But um, Jennifer, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us. My name is Jennifer Marisco. I am the Director of Global Travel and Risk Management here at the Chazen Institute for Global Business. I work on a number of our student programs, such as our Global Immersion Program, one of the short-term travel programs we're going to talk through. We also work with clubs and students on a number of events that we put on here for students by students, um, such as our Global Spotlights and Traveling Well series. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Spooner. I'm an Associate Director at the Chazen Institute. Um, I handle mostly the Chazen Global Study Tours, which are short-term student-led programs. Um, and then I also work with Jennifer on our student-facing events, the Global Spotlight Series and the Traveling Well Series, uh, in addition to a couple of other things at the Institute. But glad uh, to have everyone today. Thank you so much, both of you, for introducing yourself. Um, I will go ahead and pass it on to one of our fabulous CBS alums, Josephine, to give a little bit of um, background into her role um, and her involvement at Chazen during her time as a student. Hi, yeah, um, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Josephine Dallon. Um, I'm French and American. I just graduated in May. Um, um, with the uh, MBA and Master's of International Affairs dual degree program at Columbia. Um, before school, I worked in Rwanda for two years for a social enterprise called One Acre Fund uh, that works with over 4 million smallholder farmers. Um, so I got to lead a trip back to Rwanda, which I'll tell you more about, which was a very cool experience. Um, and now I'm living here in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, working as a product manager for Amazon as part of their leadership rotational program. Sorry, technical difficulties with my mouse. Um, it is early here in New York. I don't know what time it is where everyone else is joining us, but thank you for your patience. Um, Elisa, I will go ahead and turn it over to you now. Hi everyone, very nice to meet you. My name is Elisa Martinez. I'm from, I'm Colombian, but I grew up mainly in the U.S. My pre-CBS role, so I'm also a dual degree with the government, with SIPA, the School of International and Public Affairs, and the MBA. So pre-CBS, I was working as a data analytics manager at the state of Illinois. Over the summer, I did impact investment at Acumen Latam in, in Bogota. At, and then after CBS, I'm looking to go back into the government, but more with an international focus. And my experience with the Chasen Institute, I went on one of the Chasen study tours to Vietnam, and then currently I am helping plan the Chasen study tour to Kenya. Great. Thank you so much for both sharing your experiences. I will go ahead now and turn it over to the team here at Chasen to talk about 
the Institute, all of their different offerings and everything that entails. So take it away. Excellent. So the Chazen Institute was founded in 1991 um, with a gift from Jerome Chazen. He was an alum of 1950. He was a co-founder and lead of Liz Claiborne. And he was responsible for taking their operations international. And he looked back at Columbia Business School where he had had this great experience and said, these students are going to need to know how to work globally to be successful. And thus the Chazen Institute was born in 1991. Um, he always felt that part of the success of the company was the fact that they were willing to do business overseas and manufacture overseas. And he thought it was imperative that this global perspective would help CBS students um, with their similar achievements. He talked about when he was here, there was one class on international business, and it was not nearly enough um, to prepare students for what was out there and to be competitive. So we started with this small institute, starting doing some of these programs, and we have now expanded to quite a bit. And one of the things that the Chazen Institute is best known for here at the business school is our short-term travel program. So the opportunity to expose you to a number of different places while you're here without giving up a full semester. The Global Immersion Program is one of those. So the Global Immersion Program is a series of elective classes where you meet for half a semester in classroom sessions here in New York, and then you travel for a week to the region of focus. They're led by a faculty member and a student leader. We look for a student leader who is either from the region or has spent a lot of time in the region. So they're sharing their country or what's so important to them about that. And they're a great way to bridge theory and practice. So you talk about all these lessons in the classroom and read these case studies, and then you go meet with these business leaders in country or organizations to see how this works. And this is, this is the program that Josephine's gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, global immersion classes this year include programs that will travel to UAE, Ghana, Rwanda, South Africa, Japan, Philippines, Tunisia, Denmark, and Sweden with a family enterprise focus. We try to have a lot of different options. We travel over a number of different periods. So right now we have two trips out. This is October break here at the business school right now. So we have two groups traveling right now. We also travel in January and in March. And one of the things we wanted to mention too that we didn't put on that slide is ways we can fund these travel programs. And this will be applicable to all of the programs we talk about, but there is a Chazen Institute Travel Fund. It is a need-based financial aid program where you can apply for a grant to help offset the cost of your travel. Um, we, hold, we will open a round of applications in late spring. We do it both years. So you would do it before you arrive. So look out for emails, admissions will help us send them. Um, to apply before you get here in May or June. This way we can award students over the summer and coming into the new academic year, you'll know if you have funding. And these are grants of up to $2,000 that you can put towards the program fees of all of the Chasen Institute travel programs that are run here. And then Melissa is gonna talk about the global study tours. Um, yes, so uh, for the global study tours, um, I like to think of them as kind of sitting in the middle between uh, you're going to come to school and have a variety of travel opportunities. Some are just student trips where, you know, it's more of, a, you know, a vacation. Some are the global immersion programs like Jen just spoke about where they're led by a faculty member and have a classroom component. Study tours, they are unique in that they are non-credited, so they are extracurricular travel opportunities, but they're initiated and led by students with experience in the region. So they're led by your peers. Um, they're usually from that region or have experience working in that region, um, living there. So they can offer this unique experience of seeing um, the country through their eyes. Um, so they are designed to enhance the classroom experience. So the reason that we have developed the global study tours is you'll go there and then usually there'll be about eight to 10 company visits. So that's where you're really getting that learning experience. You're getting to understand the business culture um, firsthand. Um, so they're a really unique opportunity and we, each year is different because they are led by the students. So if we have students from a country um, that particular year and they would like to lead a study tour, you get to experience that country. Um, so some have come to CBS with a dream of organizing their own study tour. We had a student, um, Sahil, and he 
when he applied, um, talked about organizing a trip that focused on retail luxury goods. Um, and it was his dream to showcase the retail luxury good landscape in India to all of his peers. And he did it successfully. And it was start. And then always be on the lookout for the trips that are coming up. And you'll have plenty of opportunities to travel and see the world through a variety of different um, lenses. So this year, um, the global study tours are going to Australia, uh, Thailand, Kenya, China, Taiwan, Mexico, South Korea, India, with a focus on real estate, and then Europe. So usually um, Paris and Milan, that will be a retail luxury goods focus, and then UAE with a value investing focus. So like, you can kind of get a sense from this, but sometimes the uh, tours are club initiated, so they have a focus, and then sometimes it's student led where it's just the country or the perspective of the student. So um, as Jen mentioned, so we do have unique like travel periods. January um, is a big one, and then March over spring break. May, um, we have a couple of different opportunities to travel then, and then over the summer, we'll usually have one or two study tours then. We also still do have the traditional MBA exchange program. So students can apply to go on a semester MBA exchange and exchange with another business school. We have nearly two dozen of the best known graduate management institutions that take part in the exchange program with us um, and provide second year students the opportunity to immerse themselves in this multicultural environments. Students will often choose to do this to either learn from a different perspective, be in a classroom that's even more global than ours already is, and or to recruit in um, a different environment. A lot of students will go on exchange to a region they're hoping to work in. So students apply in the spring of their first year to go on exchange in their second year. Many of these are full semester exchange programs, but some of them are also half semester exchange so there's opportunities to pursue different ways of studying abroad. And then I'm going to talk about uh, Bridging the American Divides, which is our domestic program. So I'm not sure if any of you saw the article in Poets and Quants, but um, there was one recently, I think in September, that talked about like the class that you have to take at business school. Um, and then they had all of the... Um, the business schools put up the class that they thought most define that. And for Columbia, this was bridging the American divides. Um, so it's an elective design for Columbia Business School students to gain a better understanding of the causes and consequence of the divides that we are experiencing today. And it's teaching them to lead uh, across those divides to be, become better business leaders. So um, the class meets for half a semester and then they go on a trip to Youngstown, Ohio to speak with businesses and organizations about the topics that they discussed in the classroom. Um, so it's a really special program and the conversations that I've heard in that class, um, it's amazing. And I think that it's something that is often missed at business school. Um, and so the students that do have the opportunity to take the class, I think that it does fulfill um, the purpose. They, they're gaining skills to help them at least empathize with you know, people that they may not be aware of when they're making those big business decisions later on. We also do offer a number of events, that do, a number of programs that do not involve travel. So we do a number of events throughout the year, bringing external speakers to the community and providing networking opportunities with alumni and business leaders, as well as those that are more internally focused and led by students. So these are a couple of the ones that we do have. So we have the Sir Gordon Wood Distinguished Speaker Forum is a speaker series that brings a speaker to campus and it's focused on China. So it could be a speaker who's doing business in China or a multinational here talking about their business and endeavors in China. But that's offered once or twice a year. The Nandimji Distinguished Speaker Forum 
is an external speaker focused on India generally once a year. Again, someone will come and speak about their business, what the business culture is like in India. And that's a networking opportunity as well. Um, the Global Spotlight Series and Traveling Well Series are, are programs that we work on with students here. We developed these uh, during and post COVID and they give students the opportunity to tell their own stories. So the Global Spotlight Series will be a student-led event that showcases a country and have a guest speaker joining the talk to talk about business culture. We developed this during COVID when study tours were not possible as sort of a mini study tour experience, work with a club and spotlight a country when we couldn't bring you to that country. And the Traveling Well Series is aimed at creating a more inclusive environment where students will tell stories about traveling with their lens within the lens of their own identities. Um, examples of events like this would be traveling while LGBTQ+, traveling as a woman, traveling with a disability, traveling while religious, um, traveling as a veteran. We've done a number of these events. Um, both of those are PPIL. Phillips Pathway of Inclusive Leadership. This is an important program to all of us here at the business school and these help give you that exposure. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about the different offerings that Chasen has. Um, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to our fabulous CBS alum and student now. Um, so Josephine and Elisa, I apologize. I don't know what's going on with my mouse this morning. Here we go. Um, if you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing a little bit about the opportunities you partook in within the Chazen Center um, and just sharing anything else that you feel is relevant maybe, and also just sharing a little bit about your overall um, experience at CBS in general. That would be wonderful. Yeah, of course, happy to. Um, yeah, so I got to be the teacher's assistant for the Rwanda Global Immersion um, Program class. Um, so the class was called Global Immersion Lessons from Rwanda on Conflict, Leadership, Change, and Business Opportunities. Um, it was a very cool experience because um, this was the first uh, global immersion program that was specifically going to Rwanda. There had been a class previously that did Kenya and Rwanda in a week, which is very uh, packed. And so this time, um, the professor, um, Professor Akinola that I got to work with, um, decided to do a trip just to Rwanda. And um, I, uh, there were no Rwandans in my year. Being lived in Rwanda for two years um, prior to school. And um, the one of the really cool parts of the experience was that because this was the very first time there was a global immersion program to Rwanda, um, I really got to help shape um, the course, the readings, the guest speakers, and the trip itself, um, deciding, you know, what was important for people to see in Rwanda, who should we meet with, what kind of perspectives should we learn about before we go all of that. Um, so really leveraging my network that I had there and um, my previous experience because Professor Akinola had been to Rwanda but was not from Rwanda. So it was very much a collaborative effort. Um, and we also had um, actually an undergrad who's a Rwandan who also um, helped shape the course with us, um, which I think was, was quite an important perspective. Um, so yeah, we ended up um, designing a very packed uh, and exciting week for ourselves in Rwanda. We met with um, some heads of government, including the ICT minister, the head of the Rwandan Development Board, um, a lot of business leaders. Um, we went to an entrepreneurship hub, like an urban planning company, um, and we also visited a few nonprofits, including the social enterprise that I used to work for for five years. Um, so that was a very cool experience for me to get to share um, sort of that piece of my past um, with everyone on the course. Um, we also ate a lot of food, went shopping in local markets, um, we went to the countryside uh, in Rwanda, which is super beautiful, um, out to Lake Kivu, which is on the west coast of the country. So we weren't just in the capital, um, Kigali, the whole time. So I think got a nice, um, a nice overview of the country in a week. Um, and then the other nice thing is that, um, especially as a second year, it tended to be that you also had a week off before um, that week. And so a lot of people came to the region early and traveled around. And so they um, went to see the mountain gorillas, they went on safari, they went to Kenya, to the beach, etc. So there was a lot of um, a lot of 
fun adventure to be had in the region, definitely. Um, and I think two of the the highlights for me were one, getting to work so closely with Professor Akinola, who um, if you don't know of her, you should definitely look her up and definitely try to take any class or lecture, anything you can with her while you're at CBS. Um, she's incredible and getting to work so closely with her to shape the course and then actually go on the trip um, was really meaningful. And then secondly, um, just getting to go back to Rwanda um, with 30 new business school friends. Um, I just would have never thought when I left Rwanda, um, I hadn't even you know, gotten into grad school at that point that I would be back a few years later with you know, 30 MBA friends. Um, and just to get to share this country and this region, um, that's really important to me with all of them. Um, and yeah, I think we had really good luck with just the culture of the class, the people who were on the trip, um, the professor, I think, really set the tone. And um, we just had an incredible experience. And number numerous people came up to me and said, like, this was the highlight of their time at CBS. Um, so yeah, it definitely was for me as well. And I recommend um, definitely going on, um, on one of these trips during your time at CBS if possible. Thank you so much for sharing. That sounds like a fabulous trip. And it sounds like you did a lot during that time. So really appreciate getting to hear your perspective. Um, Elisa, I'd love to throw it over to you now to discuss your participation in your trip last year, as well as your upcoming trip um, this year. Yeah, so I participated in a Vietnam Global Study Tour last year, just as a participant, it was my first time ever in Vietnam. Uh, and it was actually, correct me if I'm wrong, Melissa, I think the first ever Chazen trip to Vietnam. Uh, <clears throat> if it was not the first, it, we did not been there in a very, very long time. And I think it may have been one of the first study tours. I think we may have gone for a global immersion program, um, but study tour wise, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, kudos to, to the planner for that, because it's a lot harder when you're kind of leading the way on that stuff but he did a really incredible job uh, and it was just an amazing experience I mean um, I think the global study tours like they're different than a tourism tour you know you will do some touristy things but it is not the same as global tourism you know there are definitely some of the more touristy things in Vietnam that I miss but I felt like the things that I got to see gave me a much realer and much more complete picture of Vietnam than what you normally do when you travel to a country. I think that's a really, really unique thing that Chazen offers because normally I think it's very difficult to actually get a real sense of a country just from visiting there because normally the things you're seeing are things no one who actually lives there ever goes to. <laughs> like I, you know, for anyone who's in New York right now, how many times have you been to the Empire State Building? probably zero unless someone visited you and made you take them um and so I think it gives you this really unique opportunity if you're not someone who maybe is from there or knows someone very closely who is from there to actually get this very deep sense of a country and its people uh and its business culture which I think is also this really unique element where you get to meet with all these really important business leaders from these wide range of industries and that's just not an opportunity I mean you would ever get outside of business school even even if you are from that country you still wouldn't get that opportunity you know I from Colombia I've never gotten to meet with the executives of Colombia's top you know different top companies so it's just really an, an extremely unique experience uh, which I I really really enjoyed I thought Vietnam in particular was just a spectacular place to visit because it's in a period of such change that it was just extremely interesting and to Josephine's point, you also make a lot of very close friends. So one of my best friends right now is, you know, we kind of knew each other before Vietnam, but we really became close on the Vietnam trek. So, yeah, it's just a wonderful experience. Uh, in that vein, I'm actually now helping co-organize the Kenya Global Study Tour. So the leader of um, the, you know, the main person organizing that tour is Kenyan. Uh, it's my friend Fakunda, but there aren't um, other, there's only one other Kenyan in our year uh, and she's going to be in London during that, during the the time of the tour, during a Chase and Exchange program. So uh, he was looking for other friends to, you know, other people to help him organize the tour. So that's another thing I would encourage you guys to think about. 
if you're from a country that isn't the U.S., that can be a really cool opportunity to organize a tour. But additionally, a lot of times, especially for countries where there isn't as much representation, the organizers will need help from people who maybe aren't necessarily from that country. And that can just be a really cool opportunity to lend support to a really um, incredible experience. So he's kind of leading the way in terms of who we need to meet with and how to kind of paint, I guess, the narrative of the tour. Uh, and then I'm helping a lot more with things more on the administrative side. So, you know, looking at visa requirements and things like that. But that's just been a really cool opportunity as well to kind of see see the other side of how this process gets made. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a great comprehensive view of some of the different offerings that CBS offers through the Chase and Center. Um, we're going to go ahead and now turn it over to the audience for some Q&A. Um, so if you have any specific questions for um, any of our fabulous panelists, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. We do have quite a few questions that have come through already. So I will go ahead and pose them to the group. Um, there are a couple questions that I want to kind of start off with specifically regarding um, January um, entry students. So um, there are two questions that I want to kind of dive into first. Um, the first is one that I maybe can assume the answer to, but want to turn it over to either Melissa or Jennifer to answer. Um, are the January trips open to J-Termer students? Um, and then another student would also like to know um, how the TA student experience timeline may differ for a January term student. Um, at least in terms for study tours, um, the sign up period is uh, for the winter tours either in September or August. So generally speaking, no, um, they wouldn't be available to incoming J termers. Yeah, the uh, the J term starts during the travel period. So incoming January term students would be able to travel with us for the first time in May or over the summer or the following fall. Um, you know, you come in and you've got a lot going on, so we don't want to throw too much at you too quickly. There are years where we have May study tours or a May block week class at times. So those opportunities would be open to the January entry students. And then once you are a second year here, J term and September term sort of goes out the window. So everyone is on a level playing field. Um, I think the other question was TA selection and how does that vary if you are a J term student? So when we're looking for TAs uh, for one of the classes, we'll work very closely with the clubs that focus on those, those regions. And most of the TAs are second years. So at that point, we don't look for a J term or a September entry. We just look for anyone who has experience in the region and wants to give their time to help make this experience valuable for the students. Great. Thank you so much. And that actually um, dives into a pretty, it's a good segue into another question about TAs and you did touch on it a little bit at the end there, um, but what can students specifically do to prepare to be a global immersion program TA? Um, what, what is that, if there's an application process, what does that look like? What are, what are the successful TAs kind of providing? Um, and, you know, just any, and maybe, you know, Elisa and, or um, Josephine can teach on or speak on um, any advice you have as kind of someone who's gone through that program? So we do a call for TAs um, when we have a program. So I've written to the Africa Business Club quite a bit this year. And I said, we're going to Rwanda, Ghana, South Africa. You know, who's out there? I need a TA from these regions. And then they'll, you know, do it, put it through their club membership and students will write back with their CV and a paragraph of why they're interested, what they feel they can contribute and why they would be good leaders for these programs. We do an interview process and, and see who's got the time, the energy, the resources, the passion to make this work. Um, it is not an easy role necessarily because students rely on you really heavily when you're in that country, but it's super valuable because you have a huge impact on the student experience. But I'll let Josephine chime in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in terms of preparing to be a TA, um, start kind of putting feelers out there. So I actually, when I started in 2020, someone, because I'm dual degree, so it's three, a three-year program, um, someone told me about, oh, there used to be this trip to Rwanda, maybe you can reach out to Chazen, but it was like 
COVID, there were no trips happening, but I, you know, had put feelers out there, started talking to Jennifer. I was involved later with the Africa Business Club. And so um, then it was, you know, pretty easy to be like, okay, I lived in Rwanda. Can I help organize this? Um, and also, you know, get involved, um, get to know any professors who might be leaving the trips um, or who might want to organize a new one um, or who might be looking for a TA. I think putting feelers out there and letting people know that you're interested in doing something, something like that can definitely help. Um, and then I think in terms of advice for the role um, and, and managing your time, um, it, it does actually depend a lot, I think, on which trip you're TAing for, because some of them um, tend to actually be pretty similar year to year. So I'm just using this as an example. Um, I don't know if this is the case, but I think we go back to India or Brazil, I think, every year. Um, the trip might be fairly similar from year to year. You might do um, similar types of visits. We might already have relationships with business leaders there to set up meetings, for example. So there the lift is a little bit less than, in my case, we were kind of creating a trip from largely scratch um, and having to reach out and form those relationships and kind of create an itinerary from scratch. So I do think that can... Um, the, you know, impact how time consuming it is. But either way, I think um, to Jennifer's point, you know, be prepared for a lot of questions from all your fellow students who, you know, in my case, most of them had never been to the African continent before, didn't really know what to expect, what to pack, what medications, what visa requirements, like all those kinds of logistical questions you're going to be the point person for. Um, and uh, I think managing your, in terms of, you know, managing responsibilities. Um, it's, you know, it's an important thing to prioritize. You want to make sure you're taking it seriously um, and uh, supporting the professor that you're working with as much as possible. Um, the good thing is often by spring semester of second year, me personally, I was done with recruitment. So it, it wasn't, you know, too challenging to balance, which I think is another, you know, good reason to largely pick second years as TAs. Great. Thank you so much. That was awesome and very comprehensive. I appreciate that. And I'm sure um, the students do as well, getting to hear your perspective. Um, kind of on the same realm of talking about the study tours, um, for Melissa, how many students approximately participate in each tour? Um, and if a student would like to plan and hold a tour of their home country, um, how are the topics and focus areas picked? Um, what does that process kind of look like on the back end? Sure. Um, so generally speaking, uh, tours are between 20 and 30 participants, but, you know, it really depends on what the tour is trying to accomplish. Uh, we've had groups go with uh, much smaller numbers, um, depending on, you know, what they want to see um, and uh, the availability of the companies to fit in a large number of people. Um, in terms of actually uh, submitting an application, uh, generally it's a six to eight month planning window. So for the January trips, um, they submitted their, they have the longest planning period, which is great. Um, they submit at the end of the year, like usually around uh, April for January. And so they'll get the summer to kind of like uh, do a lot of research and to, you know, make sure that they have all their materials ready. Um, and then it's go time in, in September. For the March and May study tours, those applications were due at the beginning of October. Um, and so they have some of the, March particular has the shortest planning window. So that's pretty much like you're um, running as soon as you have submitted your application. In terms of what makes a good application, um, really think about what, I, I think that it's helpful to have an idea of what story you want to tell to your peers. What vision do you have and what do you want the students that are participating on your trip to come away with? I think that's really important. The people that submit applications with just, you know, the the details of where they're going and, you know, what they, the companies that they want to go to, they're just throwing things on paper and there's no real plan there. I think that it's helpful to have 
kind of a storyboard of where you want things to go. And of course, we're going to make adjustments, but I think that's a good starting place. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and I think gives a good idea to students to start, get, even if you're in the application process, in the prospect process, your brain, start working and um, or in a way. Um, okay, perfect. Um, that answers a really good chunk of questions. Um, I would love to hear, and just from anyone on the panel, um, what, this is a really good question, I think. What advice do you have for folks who may not have had too much exposure to international global experiences, um, but want to learn more? What would their first point of what point of contact for first action piece be in the Chazen Institute? So Chazen Institute has an info session during the first two weeks of every semester. So come and meet us and hear about the programming. We'll talk more specifically about the timeline and what is coming up in the next couple of semesters and what makes the most sense for you. And you know, we can talk through what is there, are there areas of the world you're trying to get more exposure to? How can we help you reach your goals? Um, you know, there's a number of other things we do as well. We have our board members will do office hours. They'll talk about their global experiences or sometimes when those Woo speakers or Kemka speakers are here, they'll do small networking sessions. So there's a number of opportunities for us to give you exposure to the things you're looking for if you come and talk to us about what you're trying to accomplish. And then kind of uh, building upon that, at least for the study tours, we have info sessions that are specific to um, each travel period. So uh, upcoming, uh, an upcoming uh, info session would be for the March tours, and those will happen um, on in, in the beginning of November. And so each student group, each student leadership group will give a 10 to 15 minute presentation about their tentative trip, what they what their vision and their idealized trip would look like, including a budget range and you know uh, the dates of travel, things like that. So you can kind of learn a little bit about what to expect on each of the trips. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I'd love to pivot slightly into the kind of um, academic component of, you know, Chazen with the Global Immersion Program classes, as well as I actually have a question specifically for Elisa and Josephine, feel free to jump in on this as well. Um, you both have a really unique perspective on campus of being dual degree students with SIPA. Um, but I'd love to hear from you, Elisa, what, how easy is it to take classes um, in SIPA without necessarily pursuing that dual degree. And maybe if you could give a little context into your journey um, and how you ended up deciding to, to pursue that dual degree. Yeah, so ironically, it's a little bit easier to take classes in SIPA uh, if you're not a dual degree during your CBS year, because as a dual degree, Cap on how many external credits you can take during uh, your CBS semesters. So obviously I take all my classes at SIPA when I'm registered at SIPA, but that wouldn't count as cross-registration. But uh, for, I have lots of friends who have taken a lot of cross-registered classes. I generally have found that it's actually a lot easier to cross-register as a business school student than it is to cross-register into a business school class. So it's a lot easier to be a business school student trying to take a SEPA class or a law school class or, you know, any other class than it is to be a SEPA student or a law school student trying to take a business school class because often the most popular business school classes will be very over-registered and obviously priority goes to business school students. Um, but I would definitely encourage people to take to cross register as much as they can. There's a credit limit. Again, it's higher for regular students, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. But yeah, it's a really, really wonderful experience. There's a lot of incredible classes at Columbia. And I think one of the big advantages of being in um in graduate school is getting to kind of do things outside of just business school. And you also have the advantage that business school doesn't have any kind of concentration requirements or, you know, no, there are really no requirements outside of the core, which you'll be pretty much done with after first semester. So you don't have to worry about things like that, you know, other than just staying under that limit, you can kind of take whatever class you want at any school that you want, and it'll still count towards your credit requirements for school. Uh, in terms of doing the dual degree, so for me, it's kind of funny, like, I think a lot of people, they do the dual degree with the perspective of what would the second degree outside of business school add. 
I was kind of going in very sure I wanted to do the master's in international affairs. So for me, it was a bit more of like, what would business school add? So I mean, I think for anyone watching this video, you probably have lots of very clear ideas on what business school adds. It's, you know, it's great for job prospects. It's great for a lot of things. But I would say my advice would be, if you're going to do one of the other degrees, have a very, very clear idea of why and what you're hoping to get out of them. So for example, for me, I'm doing my SEPA degree because I have a really strong quantitative background in uh, theoretical mathematics, but I hadn't had the opportunity to study really like study in depth, more applied quantitative fields like finance and econ and data analytics. Uh, and SEPA is very strong at that. Generally, the dual degrees, the second degree is has a stronger academic leaning. I think CBS is much more balanced between academics, um, like socialization, and then also just a lot of support for, for career, for things like Chazen. The extracurriculars are much stronger at business school. I mean, it's definitely much more of a mix of things. A lot of the other programs are very, very, very academic. And generally, I would say business school opens a lot more doors for you than some of the other degrees. So I would say, like, if you're doing another degree, it's going to be largely because of what you're going to be learning there. Unlike business school, where there could be lots of other reasons why you might want an MBA other than what you're going to learn in class. So just keep that in mind and make sure that what you're going to be learning in class at your second degree is something that's of value to you. Uh, and especially something that is specifically valued at around $80,000 a year for tuition plus, you know, a similar amount for living costs in New York. So is it is it that valuable to you? That's the question. Great. Thank you so much, Elisa. That's really helpful. And I think we'll give students a lot of things to think about as they're continuing to kind of um, go on this journey. Um, Jennifer, I'd love to ask you um, kind of a little bit about the Global Immersion Program curriculum in terms of new trips. What, How do students get involved with the brainstorming process here? How do faculty get involved? What does the curriculum look like? Do, do folks have a say in that, in what the, what the actual trips look like? Um, I would just love a little more insight into what that, what that entails. Absolutely. So the curriculum for any particular Global Immersion class supports what message the faculty member is trying to give through this class. So Josephine talked a little bit about Rwanda being our first time going, and a lot of students had not been to Rwanda. They hadn't been to the African continent at all. So our curriculum was very broad. It was an overall entry into understanding Rwanda, understanding the business culture there, understanding what business opportunities there. How might you, as a graduate someday, be more comfortable doing business in this environment? And of course, to understand that, you have to understand the political and social history because it plays a really key role in where Rwanda is today. So that curriculum brought in a number of speakers and talked about topics to get you to understand that. So it might start with a broad history of overall Rwanda's place in the continent. We of course had to talk about the genocide. We had to talk about the steps in what's happened since then, but then you also have someone focus on the economy and you'll have someone focus on maybe the different industries that you're gonna talk about or industries you know you can't cover in Rwanda just due to lack of time, but that you feel are important. A class that's more thematically focused will do a mesh of understanding the country, but also understanding the themes for you to successfully understand and make the most of the meetings. So Nordic Family Enterprise, for example, will give you a background on both Denmark and Sweden, but it will also talk about family business themes so that you're fluent before you get there. So what does succession look like? What does you know family planning look like? How the different sorts of ways they set up their family businesses there and what to look for in the different generations and how things have, have moved forward over the years. So that's a little bit about the curriculum. Students will do assignments over the course of their time while they're here and they will always have a final project. And the final project can vary from um, doing an in-depth analysis of something, giving advice to someone, um, things like that. That could be industries, companies, topics, political themes or government themes or, or how the country overall can be more successful in some way, shape or form. It'll really try to depend on what you're seeing in country to pull in both pre-research and what you see in country. Some of them will do consulting projects with people on the ground, but not necessarily all. And developing a new class, this comes about in a number of different ways. So sometimes it's a faculty member that proposes one to us. Sometimes it's us going after a region that is super important that we feel as a whole in the curriculum. 
and we reach out to faculty who have experience there. If we're planning really early, we will also try to bring on a student in the planning process. I've had students do independent studies and working with faculty in the year before they're going to teach the class to do research into what's out there that helps us de develop the syllabus. Whenever possible, there is a student voice involved in developing these programs to ensure that we're not planning in a bubble without student input. That's great. Thank you so much. That was super comprehensive. I appreciate that. Um, and gives a good insight into what the, the back end of this actually looks like. That's great. Um, I wanted to kind of just pivoting it slightly within the kind of, you know, we talked a little bit about funding um, in the beginning of the webinar, um, but I'd love to kind of hear maybe a little bit more in depth about what that application process looks like in terms of applying for funding for the study tours, for anything involving the Global Immersion Program. And then there is a question in the chat specifically asking about um, what kind of the additional costs tend to look like for if they were to do a semester or a, a chunk of time um, exchanged with another program. I, I assume it obviously varies depending on the program, um, but would love to hear a little bit more insight into that. Sure. So the Chasen Institute Travel Fund application that comes out at the end of each year is something that we manage in collaboration with the financial aid office. It is primarily based on financial needs. So students will be asked to submit an application that gives some background on their funding as they would give for other financial aid applications, um, but also talking about their travel experience and why this experience would be impactful for them and, and what the need is. And then we'll review it in collaboration with them and fund as many people as we possibly can. Students will have this funding available to put towards a program in the following year. So that'll be an application. We try to send something out through admissions for the incoming first years and, and through the listservs here for rising second years. And then students have the opportunity to, to fill that in. There's a statement and the questions that you would answer. Um, for going on an MBA exchange program, the way MBA exchange programs work here is that you continue to pay your tuition and fees to Columbia. So you do not, not have a change in how that looks when you the partner school. The changes or additional costs will be the flight there and back, visa requirements, what housing might look like there. Um, oftentimes it's, it's finding your own housing. So it'll largely depend on the country you choose and whether that's a more expensive or less expensive country. And um, But most of your expenses will still be paid directly to Columbia. Your visa would still be through Columbia. Your financial aid package remains active here. Um, so a lot of that remains the same. And then it depends how long the exchange program is and, and where you're gonna be. Mara, is it okay if I jump in and add Please. a little bit of context for the study tours, just because this is a question that we often get. Um, the study tours are also different in that they are paid out of pocket. Uh, sometimes students think that they can also pay for them through tuition, which is not the case. Um, so, you know, just putting that out there that those generally speaking run about 2000 to we're, we're seeing most tours come in at 2000 to $3,000 per trip. Um, and that would be for the program fee um, by itself. And that's not including like international flights or anything. However, one of the things that I did want to mention is one of the benefits of organizing a trip is that you get your program fee covered by Chazen. So if anyone's out there who would like to organize a trip that is, you know, one of the, the great um, plus more leading uh, that to the business school. That's great. Thank you so much. And that's, I did not know that. That's a great little piece of info that um, the TAs get that support. So that's fabulous. Um, we're going to, I want to say thank you to everyone in the Q&A. There are lots of questions still. Unfortunately, we will not have time to get through all of the questions, um, but I would like to ask two more questions. Um, one to kind of the Chazen team to see if they have any insight into this and then one specifically for Elisa and Josephine. Um, and I think Josephine can maybe touch on the first question as well. Um, but if you have this information historically, what percentage of Chazen alumni or just CBS students in general um, end up working abroad post-graduation? And does Chazen or any institutes that you're familiar with on campus have a program of fund to support CBS students who are working on starting a business in a foreign country? 
So I, I do not have that statistic handy, um, okay. <laughs> but there are people in the Career Management Center who specifically work on supporting students who want to work abroad or who are international students. Um, I think you were asking a question about starting a company, um, but there we do have a, the Lang Center for Entrepreneurship here, which has a lot of support features for students who are interested in making and starting their own company. So that would definitely be the best place to check for any sort of opportunities there. They have a lot of different options for whatever students are looking for. And I, I think your question may have been a, an extension of, has it had a direct impact on students' career path? Is that correct, Mara? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, both Jen and I have talked to students who have graduated and they come back and tell us that it has led them in a direction that they were not expecting, whether or not that means that they've worked interna like work internationally. You know, I, I personally have had experience with students deciding to go back to the country that they organized a trip to, um, to either like invest there or to start a business there. Um, but more generally, I think it's just the awareness of what's happening internationally coming involved uh, you know I think a student would otherwise. and the comfort level of doing business there so even if you're working at a consulting firm in New York but now you've had this experience and you're more comfortable doing business there so yes anecdotally we do hear that but we don't have specific statistics on it totally no that's great and I will just plug I will say you mentioned the Lang Center we're doing a webinar with them as well um, I, that is next Wednesday. So keep an eye on your emails, join us for that. Um, and you can ask them that question as well. And maybe they can give some insight into that too. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I thought we'd end on kind of a fun question for Elisa and Josephine. Um, what are your most memorable experiences, events, activities that you did um, in your respective trips to Rwanda and Vietnam. Um, I'm And maybe Elisa, maybe something you're looking forward to doing in Kenya. Um, I'm sure the students would love to end on this note. Yeah, so I'll say some of my favorite memories from Vietnam. One was that we got to meet with this entrepreneur who he'd started this motorcycle company, this electric motorcycle company. And this really creative system of being able to rent the batteries, which both made it easier to kind of avoid the problem that, you know, if you have a gasoline powered motorcycle, you could go to a gas station and just like power up in a few minutes versus if you have an EV, charging takes much longer. So his battery packs were replaceable. So you would go to the gas station, you would just switch out for a fresh battery pack. And then that also meant you could do it on a subscription model, which made the barrier to entry much lower. So that was, it was super cool to hear about the business, but also we got to ride the motorcycles. Uh, <laughs> so that was super cool. Uh, and then it ended up coming up in like a couple of news articles, you know, a few months later, this very company. And so, you know, we also got to feel cool and ahead of the curve, like, oh, we knew about them before, before they were big stuff. So that was just a super cool experience from kind of the more business side of things from the just like on it just the like more tourism side of things we ended the tour uh on a cruise through La Huang Bay which is like this incredibly beautiful place in Vietnam and it was a private cruise just with everyone from the Chazen trip so that was super cool and it was just a really really nice opportunity to get to really bond with everyone you've just been on this long trip with and then for Kenya, I would say the thing I'm most excited for is that one of the Kenyan alumni has offered to host us at her house for dinner. So that's and, and she's inviting a couple of other alumni, another couple of uh, guests to come as well. So I think that's just going to be a really cool experience. And I'm also just very curious to see this woman's house because she can invite 30 people over for dinner. So <laughs> that's a <pretty> big nosy. <laughs> but I think that'll be a really, really cool experience. Wonderful. That sounds great. Josephine, would you mind sharing? Yeah, no, of course. Um, yeah, I think the first memory that comes to mind for me was one of our last nights in Rwanda. So I mentioned earlier that we had an undergraduate student um, named Gloria who was from Rwanda. She was studying and she was in her um, last year of undergrad at Columbia and she was working as Professor Akinola's um, research student. And so she actually helped us 
plan the Chazen um, course and trip uh, because she's from Rwanda and she was actually able to come along with us to Rwanda and um, her whole family hosted us for dinner. So actually very similar experience to what um, Elisa has to look forward to. Um, and it was just a very cool experience because I think we had spent a lot of the week talking to government officials and business leaders and entrepreneurs, but we hadn't necessarily talked to that many average, um, just regular Rwandans and to be, um, you know, in their family's home. They had spent the whole day cooking for us, including like the neighbors would come over to help. Um, when we got there, the power was out. So they were getting, you know, the full Rwandan experience. Um, and it was just a very, very cool experience to see, uh, to get to, to get to talk to them and just hear their perspective on things to see, um, what life was like for them for, you know, just a pretty average family. Um, and then I think for me personally, it was a very cool experience um, to do our um, like company visit uh, to the social enterprise that I worked for for five years called One Acre Fund, um, which works with smallholder farmers. And so we spent uh, the day out in the countryside, which in Rwanda is just stunningly beautiful, um, and got to you know see what it's like. Okay, this is a meeting of farmers who are learning how to plant their seeds properly so they can get higher yields, like everything that I work for um, for five years to be able to share that with um, my CBS classmates on the trip was a very cool experience. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. That does wrap up our time. Thank you to our fabulous panelists for participating today. Um, this was a great webinar. Um, so we're super excited to continue to learn about Chazen. Um, so one thing to note is after this webinar, I'm going to be connecting um, with Jennifer and Melissa to get some video links out to you all. So just to kind of share a little bit about um, some of the different trips that, you know, Chazen has taken over the years. Um, so keep an eye on your email for that. Um, that will be coming out shortly. If you have any specific questions um, about the admission process, about Chazen that we can follow up on, please don't hesitate to reach out to the admission office. Um, we are available you know, all the time to answer any of your questions through this email. Um, but again, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, our panelists. Have a wonderful rest of your week and we look forward to hopefully hearing from you soon. Thank you so much.